Uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, where, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to this first session looking at the EU-Mercosur trade agreement. Uh, my name is Maria Garcia, I'm from the University of Bath, and it's a real pleasure uh, on behalf of the European Liberal Forum and Patty Ashton Forum to, to welcome you all to, to this session uh, today, where we'll be looking at uh, protectionist protectionism and what role it plays in the EU-Mercosur uh, trade agreement and association agreement. Before we start off, there are a couple of housekeeping announcements. So uh, firstly, if anybody wants to follow the event in Spanish, we do have live interpretation available. So if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen and you click on the little interpretation icon, you will be able to hear everything in Spanish on the Spanish channel. Um, you will also find on the bar at the bottom, the Q&A icon. So throughout the whole uh, seminar today, you'll be able to post your questions at any moment on the Q&A box, and we will take them and our panelists will endeavor to answer them towards the end of the session. So. We'll start off with uh, an official introduction and welcome on behalf of the European Liberal Forum by Sonia Han, who's the Vice President of ELF. Sonia? Hi, I'm uh, Svenja Han. Uh, as you can see, I'm now Daniel Kadek, who was primed in the program. Um, he asked me to, to chip in. I'm a vice president of the European Liberal Forum, also vice president of our party, the ALDI. Um, but I'm also uh, active uh, in the European Parliament in the International Trade Committee. And the Mercosur Agreement uh, for certainly is one of the most debated trade agreements, I would say right, right after TTIP um, with the US. And um, I think it, it uh, came, it is a good example how much uh, differences we have and what a trade agreement actually contains, the expectations and the public opinion we have in regard of trade agreements. It is a trade agreement that has been negotiated for 20 years. It would have been the biggest block by block agreement. Um, it would have entre bloques y um, va a tener los mercados más grandes conectados en el huge huge potential. But what's happening now? It's uh, I would not say in the in the fridge, but uh, it's definitely in the back of the draw of uh, our cupboard. And um, we, we really need to ask ourselves why. I think we had a lot of myths and I think being a trade politician, a lot of the work you're actually doing is busting a lot of myths and misconceptions um, regarding trade. I think what is mostly outstanding um, is the matter of environmental protection. I think we all remember the, the pictures of the burning Amazon. And I think it's our jointly responsibility to combat climate change, to stop deforestation. Um, but if we actually take a look at the Mercosur Trade Agreement, we would actually see that there are binding commitments to the Paris Climate Accord, that there are binding measures to, to reforest uh, forests, to stop the deforestation, the illegal deforestation, uh, and quite the opposite to actually harvest, for example, uh, Brazil nuts, which grow uh, there in the Amazon rainforest. So the question we would have to ask ourselves, why is it that we have such misconceptions that, well, such an agreement would actually, for the first time, give us the opportunity to have a say on what is happening there. Because without an agreement, uh, Brazil and Mr. Bolsonaro uh, would not have to give a second thought about our opinions. But with such a trade agreement, we would have leverage, we would have a place on the table. Um, so I think a lot of, of the discussion will be about... Um, ¿Cómo podemos abordar estos conceptos? people of the potential we have there. That was just a, as a matter of combating climate change, which is a challenge we all have to face together. But it's also a matter of geopolitics. 
and we currently see it, we live in a time of autocracy versus democracy. Um, we see that in Europe, we had dependencies, for example, uh, in, in regarding to energy towards Russia, we see we have economic dependencies towards China. And um, to get out of this, we need to strengthen our trade relation. We need to diversify our trade relations with other countries. And especially in, in South America, uh, if we are not engaging with partners there, they will be searching for other partners. And China is among the first to step into this void and increasing their activity. So trade can and must play a role in the world in safeguarding human rights, in combating climate change. But we also need to address the realistic impact trade can have and what is a task for other policy areas like foreign policy. So trade has always been in the in the kind of like in between the chairs to say, because in my opinion of the lack of absence of a working EU foreign policy. But today we want to focus on the trade side of the potential and how we can actually get to the point to unlock the potential of the Mercosur trade agreement with the European Union. We have some distinguished speakers today. We're really excited about all of you joining us today. And I give back the floor to Maria. Thank you very much for joining this ELF event today. I hope you're going to have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Svenja. And um, you've highlighted some of the things that will come up very clearly in both Oscar and Nelson's presentations. And that is the issue of myth busting. So I think in their presentations, they will start to, to bust some of those myths and give us real clear insights into the trade relation between the EU and Mercosur. So I'd like to just uh, introduce our, our speakers today. Uh, the first speaker will be Oscar Guinea. He is a senior economist at the European Center for International Political Economy in Brussels. He'll be followed by Nelson Yeskas, who is a lawyer, consultant, and director at the Institute for International Agricultural Negotiations Foundation in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And unfortunately, Eugenio Mari was taken ill and will not be joining us today. But Oscar, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thanks, Maria. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, if I could please uh, give the slides. Thanks very much. So uh, good afternoon to those in Europe and good morning to the brave ones uh, who are watching us uh, in Latin America. It's a pleasure to, to speak at this event. Uh, and let me, let me thank the audience for taking the time to, to be with us. If we can move to the next slide, please. Good. Good. So in the next uh, five minutes, I will I'm going to speak relatively briefly about three themes. Uh, the first is I want to speak about the modern realities of EU Mercosur trade and investment. Uh, second of all, I want to present you some statistics about the impact of the agreement. And finally, uh, the third point is that I want to put the EU Mercosur Association Agreement into the context of the debate about the EU open strategic autonomy and the EU strategic dependencies. Uh, so, great. Um, yes, so basically uh, the, the EU Mercosur trade and investment. So for years, uh, this relationship has been, I would say misrepresented as one based on all colonial ties and trading commodities. Uh, Portugal and Spain leading the way, it's been the only countries who are interested in the agreement. I think this is wrong. And in reality, all EU member states have developed economic links with Mercosur. And these ties, they basically include all economic sectors such as IT, finance, manufacturing, banking, engineering, chemicals, in addition to, of course, agriculture. Agriculture deserves special attention uh, because, because of the sensitivities that the sector raises for the ratification of the uh, association agreement. The EU is the largest buyer of Mercosur agriculture exports. However, Mercosur exports in agricultural products to the EU represent only 3% 
of EU total agricultural imports once trading agricultural goods within the EU is considered. And a significant part of EU imports of Mercosur agricultural products are actually inputs into EU agriculture, Mercosur into EU agriculture. So Mercosur producers were adding value added to agriculture exports, the European agriculture exports. But again, again, I mean, if we kind of the focus on agriculture kind of takes away from the actual realities of the EU Mercosur trade that I was speaking about before. So the Mercosur, let's take this example, Mercosur exports of business services, uh, consulting, etc., to the EU were much larger than Mercosur exports of soja, beef, and sugar to the EU put together. In 2019, the EU and Mercosur exchanged services for a value of 32 billion euros. And these figures actually kind of symbolize the movement away from trade in traditional sectors towards trade in more complex products, which is in tune with the realities of modern economies. Let me give you another example. Only the announcement of the association agreement between the EU and Mercosur led to a 10% increase in cross-border internet visits of e-commerce websites between the EU and Mercosur countries. I mean, I think that, that figure and that stat is really significant. And what is happening in trade is actually mirror in investment. So not, I don't know if our audience know that a submarine cable between the EU and Mercosur has been built and is currently working towards supporting direct internet access between the two regions. And this will support trade in telecoms, in business services, in data transfers between companies and consumers between within the, the two regions. So, and Argentina and Uruguay, let's give you another example, have re received data adequacy from the EU. And Brazil has data privacy laws, which actually mirrors the EU General Data Protection Regulation, also known uh, for its acronym as a GDPR. So nonetheless, I mean, it's important also to put in context and not, and not the elephant in the room or the dragon in the room is that despite the commercial ties, that each region has gradually declined in relevance to, to one another, which has been exacerbated by the rise of China. And it is China, not the EU, the first destination of Mercosur total exports. And this is, uh, this is why the agreement is important because the economic relationship between the EU and Mercosur has the potential to become a lot stronger if the rules that are being those relationships improve. Uh, let's move to, to the next slide. So what is the effect of the EU Mercosur Association Agreement, right? Why, why we should care? Why should we listen to, to this? Uh, so the Association Agreement will actually eliminate tariffs, will increase import quotas, will offer access to each other's public procurement markets, and will lower non-tariff barriers between the two regions. And these changes will result in higher economic growth. The EU and Mercosur countries will see the GDP increase as a result of the agreement. And higher GDP means more employment and higher wages. And this economic growth will also increase CO2 emissions, but much less than the proportional increase in GDP because a lot of the trade will be done in less energy intensive sectors like services. The figure that you can see in the slide was produced by Maria Concepcion La Torre and others in their study of the economic impacts of the EU and Mercosur Association Agreement that has been commissioned and published by the Spanish government. Uh, yeah, there you are. So the EU Mercosur Association Agreement it took more than 20 years to negotiate, a bit like the tango, but it's, its ratification has taken so long that the world has actually changed since the negotiations were concluded three years ago. Uh, unfortunately, we went through a global pandemic, experienced shortages of several products, and in February of this year, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. And in the EU, the policy discussion has actually shifted towards open strategic autonomy and the need to lower EU strategic uh, dependencies. Uh, 
So open strategic autonomy is kind of a relatively open concept, which is actually understood better if we look at the regulation that has been approved or and the discussion to furnish the policy. And in a way, one could argue that the regulation on due diligence, for instance, on forced labor, on deforestation, could be helpful for the agreement, since there is this less need to strengthen the environmental and human rights provisions of the association agreements, since the EU has done it unilaterally. However, others, uh, in good, with, with uh, good reasons, could actually argue that such a view disregards the cause of these regulations on Mercosur countries, for example, that they have to pay more to comply with the regulation without receiving anything in return. And the association agreement, which actually includes a series of regulatory dialogues that with the autonomous measures will become probably less relevant since the EU has already regulated on these areas that were supposed to be discussed unilaterally and in an independent and autonomous way. So the discussion on dependencies, however, is probably more helpful to the association agreement, since the agreement offers a tool to diversify imports at a lower cost. Uh, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine has actually shown that the EU needs to make friends to get these countries on board and to diversify its sources of supplies across key, key uh, critical products ranging from minerals, energy and agricultural commodities, to certain chemicals, and some of this are uh, abundant in, in the Mercosur countries. So, and to make friends and to get the imports that are in high demand, the EU need carrots in addition to, or rather than sticks. So let me move to the next slide and let me finish by trying to answer the question of the debate, which is protectionism, does it, shows, does it show its face? And the answer is uh, absolutely. Uh, Mercosur has a relatively high level of tariffs, and the association agreement offers the EU, uh, EU companies the possibility to be the first in jumping the tariffs. It also offers regulatory and political cooperation between the two regions when the EU wants to be a geop geopolitical, geopolitical power. Um, so it is actually now the time to ratify the agreement. Uh, we can discuss this later during the, the open uh, the questions and answer. Uh, probably the elections in Brazil, which are scheduled for the 2nd of October. Probably if there is a change in government, Lula's government is ready to reopen the EU Mercosur Association Agreement. Uh, but this discussion, which will include the environment and climate, might also include areas where the EU has achieved important gains in the negotiation, for instance, market access or for manufacturing goods and government procurement. So uh, if we move to my final slide, uh, uh, this is the, the end of my presentation. I hope it's been useful uh, and many thanks for everyone uh, for listening. At the European Center for International Political Economy, we are, host, we are hosting an ongoing project on new Mercosur relationship which includes paper, blogs, and videos. So feel free to visit our website uh, if you want to learn more about it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Oscar. That was uh, a very, uh, a tour de for force in very short period of time, busting some of those myths and also posing some interesting questions that we'll pick up in the discussion in a second. But first we'll hear from uh, Nelson Yeskas. Nelson, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. Tell me if you can see my presentation. Yes, it's okay. Well, I, I'm going to talk about subsidies in the agricultural sector. Uh, uh, as I said, it's an, uh, an unfinished agenda. But first of all, let me thank to all the organizers and, and the audience for, be, for allowing me to be here. Uh, to making this this presentation, so I, I'm going to focus my presentation on subsidies. That is a a part of the negotiation that usually is set aside in regional trade agreement, like is the case of, of Mercosur uh, EU agreement. But uh, we still there is room for for discussion for this for this topic. So the, the subsidies discussion or, or subsidies. Uh, Regulation started uh, with the Uruguay round in, in, uh, with the creation of WTO where countries decide to set a limit 
on the amount of subsidy that they can uh, use to support their their cultural sector and also decide to move on on negotiation keep on uh, reducing and keep on cutting the amount of of this uh, domestic support uh, for for the agriculture in 2001 we have the doha ministerial conference where the doha round started and countries start to negotiate this idea of reduce uh, subsidy but negotiated was very negotiation was very strong very very hard to to get so the negotiation was stagnated till 2015 where we have a a glimpse of what we call a, a, a result that it was the nairobi package where countries uh, committed to eliminate uh, export subsidy that is that was an important part but not the 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 biggest part of subsidies to agriculture and finally this year 2022 we have the uh, Geneva package where the discussion wasn't part of the of the of the table we have yes uh, an agreement on subsidy but only for fisheries not for the agriculture sector so with the negotiation on the radio stagnated what about the other uh, international forum where this these kind of issues can be discussed for instance we have the uh, sustainable development goals the sdgs which and a specific mention on the goal number two that is zero zero hunger uh, where they 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 push forward they try to correct and prevent trade uh, restriction and distortions in world agricultural market we can assume that domestic support is part of this agenda but again they uh, they derivate that to the Doha development round that as we said is stagnating what about the G20 G20 is the uh, uh, the the biggest forum or at least the most important forum uh, this uh, these days well it's not part of the agenda even though agriculture sector and the agriculture discussions are part of the agenda the specific part of subsidies doesn't appear in any statement in any declaration since 2008 to today so this is a a, 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 um, a topic to take into into account meanwhile oecd has shown us how uh, support to agriculture has reached a new record uh, in this uh, this year the three year 2019 2021 in comparison to 2018 2020 an increase of 13 percent especially giving off uh, the situation of the pandemic but here is not taking into account the situation in ukraine so we are expecting that this increase could be even more in the in the future and what are the countries that are subsiding subsidizing the most well in the past developed countries were the responsible for most of the 80 percent of the of the subsidies amount but nowadays developing countries with china indonesia turkey and some others are the ones that are increasing a lot the use of this uh, type of of measures we can see this in the in the in these slides uh, where a uh, developed country has reduced the use of this uh, this type of subsidies but still remain very very important uh, for uh, the amounts of domestic of domestic support and this <laughs> while i was preparing my presentation this report came up uh, a couple of days ago uh, with a couple of, of very important uh, international organization that they start talking about that is needed a more broad-based cooperation on subsidies. We are all agree on that. But then they say that governments should work speedily to clarify and strengthen international disciplines around subsidies, while recognizing recognizing that the important role that well-designed subsidies can play in some circumstances. It's very important this change of language. Keep keep on on, on that because in FAO. We have the same Porque idea. En la, F, en la FAO tenemos esta misma idea de cambiar los objetivos de las subvenciones, pero no de reducirlos. Así que ahora estamos hablando de una readaptación. For countries like ours in, in the past. So we have this report for from 2021. Well, 
uh, this multi-billion dollar opportunity with a focus mostly on environmental issues. And this year, with the state of food insecurity, the repurposing, again, is part of the, of the language, but now is about changing the, uh, the foods to the consumers. So changing from some types of, 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 uh, of products that are being subsidized, for instance, cereals and, and cattle, to another, uh, to another uh, product like fruits. So again, these concepts of repurposing than eliminating uh, the subsidies. And what about regional trade agreements? Regional trade agreements are not uh, the place where subsidies are discussed. Most of the of the of the regional trade agreements uh, directly say that all the subsidies must be in order or must be uh, confirmed to the provision of WTO. So as we see, the WTO is stagnated. So uh, some other address this topic and say that uh, we have to reduce agricultural subsidy, but there are no commitments on that. So uh, it's very hard to find a place to discuss. Uh, to discuss these these kind of topics, there are some free trade agreements that are trying to go beyond the WTO rules, uh, con containing, for instance, uh, provision disciplining the behavior of state-owned uh, enterprises, or trying to to create a list of prohibited subsidies. But are the list? And, and what about Mercosur EU? That is is the one that we are talking in in this in this seminar. Well, they. Uh, they have a part, uh, the, the agreement have a part, a specific, a specific part on subsidies with some principles that, uh, let me quote, it said subsidies can be granted by a party when they are necessary to achieve a public policy objective. The parties acknowledge, acknowledge, however, that certain subsidies have the potential to distort the proper functioning of markets and undermine the benefits of trade liberalization. And then they open to cooperation to cooperate in order to coordinate positions and proposals on WTO to improve transparency. That is a, a, a very important uh, issue in this in this kind of, of measures. Make some analysis of, of the impact and finally to exchange information. But again, there are no commitment to reduce or to eliminate this kind of, of, of measures. And let me let me finish with this these final remarks. WTO has not made significant progress, especially in domestic support, because as, as we see in, in regarding export subsidy, we have some, some, uh, some outcomes during Nairobi. And, and this is important. The standstill of the dispute settlement body make very difficult the discussion of subsidies, because without an appellation body, we cannot have a resolution on a, on a discussion regarding subsidies if we want, we want to go to, to the WTO to discuss this. The issue is not part of the C20 agenda. And the negotiation to reduce and eliminate has moved its access to repurposing. Uh, regional trade agreements do not regulate them or refers directly to WTO and EU and Mercosur is part of this, this trend. Meanwhile, trade conflicts, the war, and the COVID pandemic have led to an increase in agricultural subsidies. Let me finish with this, and, and I'm open to all the, the questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nelson. That was, uh, again, very informative. I'd like to just remind the audience that you can type in any questions or comments you have using the Q&A button at the bottom of, of the screen. Uh, so whilst you think about questions and start typing them up, I'll, I'll start off the discussion with Oscar and, and Nelson with some, some ideas we had pre-prepared. Um, Nelson, I think um, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the precise implications of this, this shift to repurposing agricultural subsidies away from the reduce and eliminate approach. Now we know that throughout years of the WTO, the discussions on agricultural support, even though they were about reduction and elimination uh, of subsidies have really 
countries have essentially morphed their measures to green box measures, to measures that would be allowed under the WTO. So they haven't necessarily uh, eliminated agricultural support. And of course, uh, countries with lower levels of support, typically the Australias, the New Zealands, the Cairns group, the Argentinas and Mercosur countries included in here, have, have also opposed these shifts over you know, over the last decades at the WTO. So is this repurposing debate fundamentally different or is it just more of what we've been seeing over the last decades? No, yeah, uh, th there are a, a couple of things on that. Uh, first of all, uh, this idea of repurposing uh, starts mostly in, on, on, the, on FAO. First of all, in the, the, in the 2021 report, while they are saying that we, we should we should shift from some subsidies that are increasing the greenhouse emissions because they are subsidizing some sectors that are more intensive on this, uh, this kind of emission, switching to another uh, sector that are uh, less contaminant or less, uh, uh, less emitters than the previous one. But again, they are not talking about reducing or even eliminating. Uh, so the, the effect it remains the same. Así que el efecto sigue siendo el mismo con respecto a nuestra discusión. Este año con la take, take into account that the, the agenda of food security has grown importance in, 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 in our in, in the recent in the recent months, especially because of the, the conflict in, in Ukraine. But we, we have been uh, facing an increase in inflation. In the in the in the world, so this is a, a the 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 food security is a key issue uh, nowadays. But still, uh, even though food security is very important, repurposing uh, from one sector to another, not not is not going to solve the, the 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 question. It's not going to solve the situation. We are in a, a, a we have been saying that okay, but if you are shifting the products from cereals or cattle to, for instance, uh, fruits or, or, or some other uh, summer products, you still are using a, a lot of funds, a lot of uh, uh, taxpayer uh, money to subsidize sector that not are necessarily efficient, produ efficient producers of these type of products. So still uh, is, a, is an issue. And regarding the, the, the CARES group, uh, while the uh, MC12 was, uh, was, was being uh, developed in, in Geneva, uh, some, some, some institution, private institution of the CARES group uh, prepared a declaration uh, about this, this topic. And one of the key issues that they were mentioned that subsidies, domestic support, is still a, a, a very is still a very important issue and it should be part of the agenda because now we are talking on WTO about the reform of WTO to add new topics to uh, to move forward to another uh, issue that are very important in uh, for instance uh, uh, electronic trade or or, or or environmental issues but still we have to close this this uh, this topic domestic support that is still matter domestic support and not be fulfilled with this idea of only to repurpose uh, the this these subsidies thank you oscar i think part of the problem is well, we keep going round round and round in circles in international trade negotiations especially on issues of agriculture with different iterations, different nuances, but but it does seem to, to go round and round. And I suspect uh, if it took the EU Mercosur 20 years to negotiate the agreement, uh, we can probably expect at, at a global level negotiations to be even more, more challenging. Um, so we all know that the, the, the challenges of agricultural, the agricultural offer was one of the sticking points and one of the reasons why these EU Mercosur negotiations went on for, for two decades. And no sooner had those negotiations been concluded that uh, concerns over the next steps started to arise. There was that very public spat 
uh, between French President Macron and the Brazilian President uh, Bolsonaro over the fires in, in the Amazon and land clearing, etc., and Macron's insistence on incorporating the Paris Agreement into the trade agreement and the association agreement uh, between the EU and Mercosur. But we also know that throughout the negotiations, from the European perspective, European agricultural sector, particularly in France, had been opposed to giving a, a more generous market uh, access offer to Mercosur, and that had been a key sticking point. And the reason why a number of um, of deadlines were missed throughout the throughout those twenty years. So, do you think that the environmental agenda has been used as a, as a more acceptable form? argument to 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 glance over that protectionism uh it's it's not politically correct to say oh, we want to protect european agriculture we want to li- we will listen or pay heed to these uh to these arguments whereas an environmental rationale is is more popular it's it sounds better uh to what extent do you think that uh that has evolved in that manner Sorry, Maria, are you addressing the question to me or to Nelson? To, to both, to the both of you. Um, well, then, then I, I, I take it first. Nelson? You, you can go. Yeah. Okay, okay, sure. So, so let me kind of uh, start uh, answering that question, saying that the, the EU Mercosur Association Agreement is probably one of the most advanced in terms of provisions on energy, climate, environment. They're all there. The discussion is it's most it's mostly about enforcement of these provisions and what happens if one of the parties don't comply with the promise they made in these areas. So what kind of take us to what I would say the most fundamental point of the agreement is that when you look at the agreement, uh, the provisions and the regula- regulatory dialogues that establish in the agreement, do you see the bottle half full or half empty, right? Do you think it will be better for the environment that the EU has a direct line, line of communication with the Mercosur countries? Or do you think it's insufficient and the EU should get additional commitments in the environment from the Mercosur to get the, the, the agreement ratified? And we should definitely have this discussion, uh, but we should set also some basic facts as well. As, as I said in my previous remarks, uh, the Mercosur agriculture exports to the EU were just 3% of EU total agriculture imports because most of the EU agricultural consumption comes from within the EU single market. The agreement will not increase trade in soja because the EU already imports uh, import soja at uh, zero, in, zero import tariff. Uh, and the increase in beef quotas from Mercosur as a result of the agreement is, equ- is equivalent to two stakes per EU citizen. So the agreement will increase CO2 emissions. Yes, I saw that in our graphs, but it will also support the modernization of the economy and technological progress that you also need to fight climate change. So there is, there is no question also that, you know, deforestation is a problem and it's a problem that affects us, all of us, independently of where you live. Uh, so the, the drivers of the deforestation, say, for instance, mining, agricultural production in illegal properties, so land grabbing. I mean, these are real issues that are happening now, and they're happening in some of the Mercosur countries, but they're also happening in the French Guayana. They're very difficult issues to tackle. So, and they're not necessarily related or as a consequence of the agreement itself. So to answer your question, I'm, I'm going to probably sideways, Maria. So any potential environmental effect, negative environmental effect of the agreement should be contextualized. And it's important to remember also that many of the EU agricultural products, such as wine or cheese, will gain significant market access in the Mercosur and will gain out of the agreement. In relation to climate, it probably is this kind of the sticking point here. I, my, my personal impression, and this is just my personal impression, is that maybe some people actually see the agreement as an opportunity to include commitments that they couldn't include in the Paris Accord, for instance, itself. But the EU should be mindful that if it asks too much of its partners, they may actually lose what they what it has been already achieved, which is substantial and, and I would say meaningful. Uh, the agreement will be done with Mercosur countries, 
not necessarily with Bolsonaro and Lula. And in the in the in the in the sense that the agreement should be seen from my point of view as an opportunity to create tools that the EU can build upon in order to advance its global environmental and climate goals. Thanks. Thank you very much, Oscar Nelson. Yeah, let, let me add something about about the I, I, I think I, I like to think that having an agreement is way better than don't, don't, doesn't have a, a, an agreement at all, especially regarding there are some commitments, as Oscar was mentioned, that could be enforced through this agreement. Uh, and, I, and I think that there is a mis misinformation regarding what about the, the, the upcoming effects of the, of the agreement for, for the Euro European producers or agricultural producers. Uh, the, the, the text and, and the clauses of the, of the agreement take into account very, very uh, precisely, the the the, the sensitive of both sides. So, with quotas and with uh, with uh, with programs of degradation or, or reduction of of tariff, uh, uh, um, they, they 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 I think they they make negotiators make a, a great work on on that. And again. Uh, for me, Mercosur could be also uh, a, a key partner for for EU in these current circumstances. Uh, in this uh, in these times with uh, concepts like French shoring and near shoring that are, are are coming to the to the table, uh, for me, Mercosur and EU they have more more to win than to lose to ratify this this agreement, especially uh, on agriculture and especially on environmental issues. And thank you very much to you both. And I think part of, you know, part of part of that discussion should also be the fact that in the last years, the EU has put much greater emphasis on the enforcement of its of its trade agreements, the, the, the new chief uh, enforcement officer position within the director general for trade is important in that respect, and part of part of that is is actually to receive uh, complaints or information about the implementation of the environmental and labor aspects of of trade agreements. Uh, the EU has certainly shown uh, willingness to pursue that in in the case uh, in in raising a dispute uh, against South Korea over not implementing. Uh, labor provisions or the ratification of ILO um, uh, fundamental rights. So there's certainly, there appears to be certainly a, a move within the European Commission to, to really uh, turn the dial up on the implementation and the enforcement of all aspects of trade agreements, including in particular those labor and environmental and environmental issues. So as, as both of you have highlighted that, that idea of of having a foot in, in in the door of having these dialogues of being able to uh, to to bridge that gap and and work together certainly has uh, has potential. It's just that it does take time, and I, I think we can we can all think of lots of examples uh, of of these things uh, taking time. Um, I have another question, but I'm going to take some of the questions that are coming in through the Q&A box because they are very germane to what you've just been discussing. So thank you for those questions. And to the audience, please keep posting your questions in the Q&A box. So Ivana asks, uh, regarding agricultural issues in this agreement, what do our panelists think uh, is going to be France's position? So it's known that it will be one of the countries uh, whose agricultural sector is likely to be more hit by the agreement. And certainly they've made it very clear that they're not happy about uh, the EU Mercosur agreement. So what do you think France's position might be in and how might that affect what happens next? Whoever wants to take it first, Oscar. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> So, so, so yeah, of course, I mean, everyone who has followed the news uh, and, and Macron's positions on uh, represented France on this actually will actually have the feeling 
that the agreement has a quite intense negative effect on France agriculture sector and France agriculture in general. I think this also, I also was kind of trying to, to point that out when I, when I said that the agreement will benefit uh, EU agricultural production on wine and cheese, being two of the most famous French uh, exports. Uh, and that was made uh, in, in purpose to kind of signal that some of the EU agriculture will definitely, definitely benefit from the agreement uh, as uh, tariffs and wine and cheese will be reduced. Uh, and 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 this uh, French and many of them French producers will get uh, uh, access to to that market and at, at a benefit than its competitors. Uh, in terms of the of the, some of the sectors will lose out. That's definitely true. Uh, but it's, as I said, and it needs to be contextualized. I mean, and the statistics that are the statistics, this kind of idea that the increase on import quotas on beef will only be will be equivalent to two sticks uh, per EU citizen. I think that actually tells you in terms of the size. And what Nelson has uh, kind of commented when in his reply to the first question about the sensitivity has been quite well negotiated. I mean, this agreement. We might talk a lot about agriculture, but uh, in terms of its potential, it's, it's mostly about uh, investment, it's about manufacturing, it's about technology and uh, economic modernization, rather than they all kind of talk about commodities and beef and sugar and soja, some of them. The EU is, is quite competitive in sugar, soja already arrives tariff-free, and, and, and also the sticking point point of beef for, for France and also for, for Ireland. So I suppose then we are entering into the politic, politics of trade agreements rather than the actual facts. So Nelson, do you have anything to add? No, I, uh, I totally agree with, with, with Oscar. Um, let, let me add that the, the commercial relations, relation with within uh, Mercosur and EU, it's a well-consolidated relation. That this is not going to be a huge change in, 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 in trade uh, for the ratification of, of, this, of this agreement. I, I, I totally agree with Oscar that uh, regarding uh, technology, services, uh, even manufacturing, are the key sector investment, are the key sector that are going to increase uh, the, the, the amounts of 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 of, uh, inter, uh, of trade than uh, the specific sector of agriculture. There are there are some sectors of agriculture that are going to gain with this uh, this uh, with this agreement. But let let me say to to all the the, the Europeans uh, the, the Europeans in the audience, don't worry Sobre about. Sobre todo con los públicos y el europeo, no se preocupen por el Mercosur. Mercosur no es un tema clave. You, you have the institutional channels to discuss some some topics that now are very hard to 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 find a place to to discuss. For instance, there is a a, a dialogue on uh, biotechnology. There is a dialogue on, on animal welfare that could be uh, start working uh, through the Mercosur EU agreement. So it's easier. It's going to be easier to find a common ground to discuss than in the in the current situation. Thank you very much. Again, this idea of building institutions for, for the future com comes through. So I'll keep going through some of the questions in the Q&A. Uh, Federico Fernandez asks, um, wouldn't a full functioning EU Mer Mercosur agreement provide technology to Mercosur countries to be greener and produce goods in a greener way if this were needed? So if you could comment on that and on any provisions specifically relating to technology transfers and uh, cooperation in the green economy, uh, I, I can say that if if if, if they want, uh, agricultural producers in Mercosur could transfer technology to Europe European producers in order to to them to be more greener. We are aware that our production is more sustainable, our production is more green, uh, mostly because the means and the tools that we use 
in order to produce. So we are more than glad to transfer technology and to work towards a more sustainable agricultural production in, in, in the whole world. And, and I mean it, and I'm saying for, for real. I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's one of the one of the things that uh, you discover when you get into these topics that uh, Argentina, Brazil, to say two of the of the biggest uh, largest countries, but also Uruguay and not just them, uh, Paraguay. Uh, they are extremely, they invest a lot on on research and development uh, in agriculture. Uh, and they are many times uh, at the leading of the and um, in the agricultural technological frontier. Um, I think on, uh, to me, it's probably Federico's point is it's a kind of philosophical question on, on whether uh, what is the effect of economic growth on the environment. And one of the of the drivers of economic growth is technological change. And if we kind of look at the scale of the challenge of climate change at the moment, I will say we'll need as much technology and technological change as we can get in order to, to meet those commitments. So I definitely see this as, as an opportunity to, to greener, uh, to, to, imp to reduce the energy intensity of our production uh, in Mercosur and also in the EU. Thank you very much. And indeed, a, a well-functioning trade agreement should facilitate all these exchanges in, in, both, in both directions. I think that it, something came out there very, uh, very clearly, which is sometimes the, the, the assumption that, some, that we sometimes make in Europe that we are at a height that we have nothing to learn from others. And of course, that could not be further from the, from the truth. So on that note, um, well, Nelson, since you're based in, in Argentina, and Oscar, you have very close ties to Latin America, I was curious to hear your views on the ratification from the Mercosur side. Now, obviously, we know all the challenges in Europe, and I, there is a final question, which I will come to in the Q&A about that. So we know the challenges in Europe, but what might be the challenges in Mercosur? And, and what is the, the perception in Mercosur? Because these negotiations have been going on for, for decades. This, you know, they've been waiting, waiting, waiting. An agreement is announced. They're still waiting uh, even to, to have a date for when it might be ratified. What does that look like from the Mercosur perspective? Well, we, we as, as Oscar was mentioning earlier, we are in a election process in, in Brazil. That that result, I think, it could be a, a game changer for for the for the ratification. And then the next the in 2023 we are going to be in an election process in Argentina. So that's leave us with a very small window between the new president of Brazil and the, the start of the election process in, in Argentina. Uh, but it's, it's hard to tell because for, at, at least from, from my point of view here in Argentina, it's not part of the, the political agenda, the ratification of, of Mercosur EU. We have bigger problem than, than, than this, but, but, uh, while the the current uh, president was in campaign, one of the of the issues of the of the campaign was the he was agree he was on board on the ratification of the Mercosur EU agreement. So we, we we are here to tell him remember 2000, <laughs> 2015. Well, uh, we no sorry not 2015 2019. Uh, so the chances are low. But again, is is uh, is part of of the these two election process that we are going to have this year and the upcoming year in Brazil and Argentina. Thank you, Oscar. Anything to add? Just, just to say that, uh, so there's, um, as many of us uh, or many of the people listening in are interested on this topic. So we know that the EU and Mercosur are kind of negotiating an amendment, an addendum, or an annex, an environmental annex. 
to make the agreement more palatable to MEPs in some countries. We are concerned about the environment and agriculture, we just discuss. And at the same time, I think it's, it's, it's in, in the open that some European politicians are wary of supporting a deal with Bolsonaro in power. So with the elections of Brazil scheduled for October, uh, and Lula is the current favorite. So if, the, if Lula, uh, I think in Lula, the EU will find an easier interlocutor on the environmental aspects of the agreement. Uh, you know, but it also, and it, which I think it also appears to be uh, uh, Lula more in tune with some in, Europe, in the European left who may not be in favor of the agreement or naturally in favor of the agreement. However, we shouldn't uh, misunderstand the situation and misread it. Uh, Lula and its administration has been traditionally supported of South-South agreements uh, and of more trade, uh, of more industrialization of the region. And it's likely that uh, any Brazilian government led by Lula wants to, if the if the EU and Mercosur wants to kind of look at the environmental annex. Uh, the EU might actually, or they might actually want to discuss some of the EU gains in market access. Uh, and because Mercosur may be worried that uh, some of the Mercosur industries may be outcompete the European manufacturers. Uh, and the jury, I suppose the jury is out and how what the environmental annex will be. I, I don't know that. Uh, but on the EU side, I, I suppose it's probably time or maybe the time for to balance some of the regulations and initiatives on the open strategic autonomy, which have put more emphasis on the defensive trade policies with more offensive uh, trade policies to gain market access uh, and access to foreign imports of, for EU companies and consumers uh, as a time where we are now, uh, some of these inputs are in high demand. So just kind of to on the next the next three presidencies in the EU Council, we have the Czechs, the Swede, Sweden and Spanish presidencies. And they're bound, they can set the agendas, they can and they're bound to put some emphasis on trade agreements. Uh, whether that momentum will crystallize in something tangible or not, that's something we'll have to wait and see. Thank you very much, Oscar. Um, so We'll take one final question from the Q&A, which relates to the, this ratification, the prospects for ratification. So the world has changed, as, as you started off saying, since, since uh, this agreement was finalized, the world has changed. We've had COVID, we've got the war in Ukraine, we've got a completely changed geopolitical situation. And I think you've both made the point that there is a lot to be gained on both from both sides uh, for, ha for having this agreement. And it fits in quite well with the more geostrategic and geopolitical take that uh, the EU is trying to bring to trade policy in terms of diversification of partners, et cetera. So there's certainly a, a lot of reasons for ratifying the agreement. We know there are some political obstacles to this. Uh, so what do you think the prospects of that ratification might be? And adding on to that, Horacio Sanchez Caballero asks very specifically, uh, do you think that the next round in the Mercosur EU discussion, the fact that it'll be held in the um, being that will be held with the representatives of Uruguay and Spain at the helm, will that help to push ahead with the ratification? So prospects for ratification and whether Uruguay and Spain at the helm can can help to push it. Uh, I, I think the first steps should be should be done by the, Euro, the European Union, mostly because once the European Union ratify with the ratification of one country of our region, uh, the agreement, the trade part of the agreement could be put into force. So that will be uh, uh, something that perhaps Spain and Uruguay, that Uruguay has shown uh, uh, a very proactive idea to move forward in negotiation, to, to have uh, more and more uh, agreements and negotiation, even uh, for, for their own. Perhaps this could lead to, to that. And once one country of Mercosur uh, ratify, the others uh, are going to enter into a race to, to ratify in order to, to gain the access to the European market. I think, I think probably that could be 
uh, an outcome of this uh, this uh, idea of having together the presidency of Uruguay and, and Spain that they are more think alike. Thank you, Oscar. Your your prognosis. <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, despite despite the fact that I have worked on, on international trade for a number of years, I am a half a full bottle person, so I'm optimistic. Uh, but I also recognize that some of the forces which will push towards the ratification of the agreement will be external, and some of the dynamics will come from the inside. Um, I think the, if you follow the news, the number of um, articles and sound bites in terms of the uh, creating momentum for the agreement, they are there. Uh, but there also is a, a fundamental question on whether the EU uh, is ready to actually use the powers that it has to negotiate and ratify free trade agreements, whether it's capable of doing it and whether it's capable of uh, uh, you know, showing it that, it that it can offer market access to its uh, allies and it can build long-term relationships uh, with partners. Uh, in terms of the um, having Uruguay and Spain, I think that definitely helped. Uh, I don't know much about uh, Uruguay. I know it's a force for free trade in, within Mercosur that I know. Uh, but in terms of the Spanish presidency of the EU, is definitely preparing a number of initiatives uh, and meetings uh, to put uh, Latin America back, back at the center of um, the EU discussion and to probably give the, the credit that it deserves that it has long, uh, long term due. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much to, well, to, to all our audience today for joining us and for their very interesting questions. Thank you to the ELF and the Paddy Ashman Forum for organizing this and taking the initiative of, of, of uh, having a whole seminar series on on Mercosur. The next in this series will take place on the 4th of October, same time, 2 p.m. Uh, Central European time, 10 a.m. Buenos Aires time, uh, 1 p.m. UK time for anybody in the UK. Uh, and that uh, the panelists will be advertised on online on the forum's website. And that topic will be how can cooperation strengthen food security? So again, continuing the discussion that, that Oscar and Nelson have very kindly started and kicked off for us today. So thank you very much to everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon or a wonderful rest of the morning if you are in South America. And hopefully we will all meet up again on the 4th of October. I certainly will come as an audience member to listen in and learn more. Thank you very much to everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks.